British car company that changed F1 racing forever. It shares its name with a beautiful flower. And its founder faked his own death, allegedly. You guys have been asking for this one since we started this show. Ladies and gents, this is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Lotus. Okay guys, Lotus is a massive story, turns out, so bear with me, because I'm gonna do my best. Anthony Colin Bruce Chapman was born on the outskirts of London, England in 1929. His dad ran a hotel and the weather was always cloudy and damp. So what was a pasty British boy with too many names to do? Luckily, he'd studied structural engineering and spent time in the Royal Air Force Reserves while in college at the University of London. Turns out, aeronautical engineering experience comes in pretty handy for making fast, fun, four-wheeled stuff. It's probably what led to his famous philosophy about pretty much everything. Simplify, then add lightness. Colin Chapman's first project was modifying a 20-year-old Austin 7 for local trials racing in 1948. Trials were basically long endurance races over a variety of roads and terrain. The Austin had 15 screaming Shetland ponies and Colin made enough money with it to build out a Mark II version, which began the tradition of numbering all of his cars. There have been way more than 100 Lotus models, so there's only time to hit a few of the bangers. But if you like a lot more detail and listen to podcasts, Donut has a new one called Pass Gas that covers some of the rad automotive history in depth. Each episode is over an hour long and Nolan is there. It's literally my favorite thing to do. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Also, <coughs> after trials races, Colin tried his hand at 750cc formula racing. Working nights in his garage after his day job at British Aluminum, Chapman took a third Austin 7 and modified everything the rules didn't forbid. He boxed the frame rails, added tubular cross members for stiffness, beefed up the engine, and replaced the stock tub with a lighter, more aerodynamic aluminum body. He called this the Lotus Mark III, the first of his creations to sport the name of a revered flower. If you wanna know why he picked the name Lotus, you're gonna have to take your DeLorean up to 88 miles per hour and go back in time and ask him because the dude never officially told anybody. But sit tight, the DeLorean is gonna come up again later. That's called foreshadowing. <laughs> it was soon clear that the Lotus was the fastest 750 formula car in the country and other races wanted in on it. So in 1952, Colin Chapman and his friend Colin Dare, two Collins don't make a right, officially turned his race car hobby into a business, the Lotus Engineering Company. They set up a factory in the empty stables behind the hotel that Chapman's dear old dad managed and got to work moving horsepower back into the building. You get it? It was a stable and now they're doing car stuff, horsepower. <laughs> Success came quickly with a new Mark IV model, and within two years, Team Lotus was split off from the engineering company to be dedicated entirely to racing. In 1957, Lotus launched the Mark VII, an open-air, street-legal track car. Due to a loophole in the law, people could buy it as a kit, pay for it on two separate invoices, and avoid paying sales tax. Freaking genius! One of the purest and simplest sports cars ever made, it was Lotus's first big seller and came to be known simply as the 7. Low to the ground and without doors, some said it was like driving a motorcycle with four wheels. And since they could be street registered, you could race them on Sunday, then drive them to work on Monday. They're very practical. Lotus sourced engines from a variety of manufacturers, so their specs almost always varied over time. But the general idea was that even a small motor can make a 1,200 horsepower. Mm. <laughs> was that even a small motor can make a 1,200 pound car go fast, and small motors were easy to get. The overall concept was so ridiculously good that Catrum took over the rights to build it in 1973, and they still make basically the same car today, over 60 years later. <laughs> But Lotus was just a starting to bloom. Fly!
Rush with cash from sales of the seven. Lotus developed the Elite, their first car with a roof. Kind of a nice feature if you live in the rainy, rainy UK. Taking it a step beyond the Corvette, which had a fiberglass body on a steel frame, the Elite had a fiberglass monocoque, independent suspension, and a 0.29 coefficient of drag. That's low, even by today's standards. And it's extra impressive because it was designed without a wind tunnel or computers. Computers didn't even freaking exist back then. It was sleek and gorgeous from every angle and powered by a 1.2 liter Coventry Climax <laughs> four cylinder engine that made it around 95 hertz burst. Lotus has never really been about trying to have more power, baby. It's always been about power to ratios, baby. The Elite 1700 pound curb weight, aerodynamic body, and good fuel economy helped it win its class six times at the 24 hour of Le Mans. The Lotus race team officially entered Formula One at the 1958 Monaco Grand Prix with a pair of front engine cars and did... Okay. Once they switched to the mid-engine monocoque Type 25 in 1960, the Lotus way of looking at things paid off and the wins started coming. By the end of 1963, the company was a force to be reckoned with. Driver Jim Clark won seven races that season and the first of seven Constructors' Championships for Lotus over the next 15 years. Just a couple of years later, they were also the first to win the Indy 500 with a mid-engine car. Back home at the factory, production of the delicate elite gave way to the Elan. They kept the whole fiberglass body and added a steel backbone for extra stiffness, a basic platform they're still using today. It was the first car Lotus made only for the street, but with sweet handling, four wheel disc brakes, a double overhead cam Ford engine, and the company's new F1 winning reputation, people raced them anyways. So Lotus eventually built out Elans for competition and bumped the 1500 pound car's horsepower from 100 all the way up to 100 60 sportier ponies. Around the same time, Lotus teamed up with Ford to put the Elan's hot motor into one of Ford's own cars. Lotus took the two-door Cortina, it's a beautiful car, redesigned the rear suspension and added lightness, 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 lightness. Ford homologated it for group two touring car racing and the boxy little 1.6 liter four banger sedans beat everything but the Ford Galaxies with seven liter V8s. <laughs> Lotus proved again they could punch above their weight class. The 1966 Europa was Lotus's first stab at a mid-engine streetcar. It also looked like it was designer Ron Hickman's first stab at designing a car, even though it wasn't. It's like he spent the entire class just making the front half beautiful, and then the teacher's like, all right, pencils down, and Colin's like, Oh, oh, Con wanted to branch out beyond Ford engines, so they tuned up a 1.5 liter Renault inline four and mounted it longitudinally in the back behind the cockpit. It was as fun to drive as previous Lotuses, but with no trunk or rear visibility, it wasn't all that practical. Meanwhile, the new Type 49 F1 car was running a new Cosworth V8 and kicking some serious, serious tush all over the world. It was the first car to use the engine as a structural part of the chassis. Lotus was also the first to introduce big money sponsorships into racing by painting their cars with another company's colors and logos. That is such a huge part of racing today, and they're the first guys to do it. Sadly, the super talented Jim Clark crashed in a Formula Two race and didn't make it out alive. It was a serious, serious blow to the team, but Graham Hill carried the Lotus torch and won that world championship that year. Around the same time, Lotus also developed a gas turbine powered car with all wheel drive for Indy racing and the first all wheel drive F1 car. I don't think these guys ever slept. Chapman experimented with small front and rear wings on the Type 49, but made a revolutionary breakthrough with overall design and aerodynamics with the next car in 1970. The Type 72 was wedge-shaped, had inboard front brakes, side-mounted radiators, torsen bar suspension, and larger front and rear wings. The changes were so significant that it ran 12 miles per hour faster than its predecessor, the Type 49. <laughs> Once the suspension was sorted, driver Jochen Rindt 
won four races in a row before dying in a qualifying crash. Racing for Lotus kind of seemed like a death wish at this point, but it was just accepted that racing cars were risky business. Emerson Fittipaldi jumped into the empty driver's seat for the rest of the season and held off Ferrari to win the championship for rent. That same year, the cars started wearing the colors of their soon to be longtime commercial sponsors. The black and gold John Player special livery that is now forever tied to Lotus. You still need more proof that Lotus were race car geniuses? They were the first constructor to win 50 F1 races. They even beat Ferrari to the punch, who'd been racing for seven years longer. Their last major F1 success came in 1978. After doing a little extra aeronautical research himself, Colin passed his findings to the race team, who went and shaped the undersides of the new side pods like upside down airfoils. And holy Bernoulli principle, Batman, the airfoil shaped side pods sped up the air traveling underneath the car, creating a vacuum. Colin took things a step further by mounting radiators so that the hot air they expelled flowed over the top of the car and created even more downforce. The design was literally based on a World War II fighter plane, just with everything flipped upside down. After ironing out a few kinks, the new aerodynamically optimized Type 79s regularly annihilated the competition. They came in first and second more often than not, and Mario Andretti won both the Drivers' and Constructors' Championships in one. Around the same time, the first Lotus Esprit did a slow launch onto the scene, reaching 60 miles per hour in eight to 10 seconds. That might sound weird. I know guys, the mid to late 70s were bad years for speed on four wheels, but hey, the Esprit was designed by Giorgetto Gigiario. <laughs> This time, Lotus used a mid-mounted two-liter inline four of their own design that made 130 horsepowers. In typical Lotus style, the whole car only weighed 2,200 pounds, so it handled like a champ, even though it could have used Where is he? They wanted to compete with Ferrari though, so in 1980 they bumped up interior quality, gave it a spinny whoosh engine making 210 horsepowers and a proper exotic car price tag. In America, we didn't get these for three more years because, you know, f us, right? Like almost all specialty sports car companies of the time, Lotus struggled to stay in business. By the 80s, they were selling fewer than 400 cars a year. We make more than 400 videos a year. No, we don't. We probably do. They turned to partnering with other manufacturers to make extra money and reduce the prices of their own cars. They helped Toyota develop the Mark II Supra Celica. Yeah, I said Supra. And Toyota gave Lotus engines for their new XL model. But their more infamous connection was with another UK-based car maker. Live the dream today. As the DeLorean Motor Company struggled to find someone to help them make their new rear engine stainless steel sports cars, Lotus stepped up and said that they could do it. If you ever get to see a naked DMC-12, <laughs> lucky you, it's obvious how closely it's related to the Lotus Esprit. Now, shortly after Lotus finished the project and DMCs went into production in Ireland, founder John Z. DeLorean was busted in an FBI sting for trafficking cocaine and his company collapsed. It was soon found that a lot of taxpayers' money had disappeared in the process of developing those failed sports cars. If you want to learn more about that, check out this link. In the meantime, Lotus's amazing new carbon fiber twin chassis F1 car had just been banned by the FIA. Streetcar sales were way down and the entire business was looking bleak. The weight of all that must have been really hard on Colin Chapman and on December 16th, 1982, he died of a sudden heart attack. But the conspiracy theorists, and I'm not saying that I'm one of them, but Nolan might be, they want to believe that John DeLorean poisoned him, or that Colin faked his own death and fled to Argentina. If he'd been around for DeLorean's trial, the judge said he would have thrown Colin in jail for at least 10 years. Whatever you believe, Colin's philosophy of simplify, then add lightness lived on. The F1 team did pioneering work with active suspensions, which admittingly are neither simple or light. They did pretty well with 
drivers Nigel Manziel and Ayrton Senna before those guys went on to greatness. But the Lotus team itself never reached the heights it had when Chapman was alive. The last Lotus F1 car to win a race was Senna in the active suspension 99T at the 1987 Detroit Grand Prix. There's not much worth mentioning about the F1 team after that, so, you know, we're not gonna. The production side of Lotus was also in trouble. They didn't have any money. The founder of British car auctions, David Wickens, rounded up some investors in 1983 and saved the company for a few more years. General Motors took control in 1986, then offloaded it in 93 to Romano Arcioli, a rich ass businessman who also owned Bugatti at the time. He bailed quickly and he sold Lotus to Malaysian car maker Proton in 1996, when Post Malone was only a year old. While Lotus owners bounced around, they made a few cool cars, but not much money. The only front wheel drive Lotus ever made, the Elan M100 Roadster, was launched as a sports car for the masses. Under GM's ownership, they poured tons of money into development, but they never got it back. Which is a shame, because a lot of people called it the best handling front wheel drive car ever, but it cost $40,000 back then and was powered by 130 horsepower or 162 horsepower Azuzu four-cylinder. <laughs> Sales were cannibalized by the much cheaper and more powerful Corvette and the brand new rear wheel drive Miata. They sold fewer than 5,000 of them over six years and only 559 of those were in the US. Not exactly the mass market sales figures that they were looking for. Then there was the Lotus Carlton, named after the Fresh Prince's cousin Carlton, which was a reworked Vauxhall sedan powered by a turbocharged inline six, making 377 horsepower and 419 pound feet of twinks. Sick! But the thing cost 92 grand in 1990. Desperate to make money, Lotus finally went back to their roots in 1996. The new mid-engine convertible Elise arrived with a fiberglass body shell on a bonded aluminum chassis. The Series 1 had a Rover 1.8 four-cylinder making 118 ponies, but it had a super low center of gravity and a 1,600 pound curb weight. A whole slew of special editions followed with more power, baby. <laughs> Then Lotus decided to move all traces of rear visibility by giving the Elise a roof and renaming it the Exige. A revised Series 2 Elise came out in 2000 with more refined styling. And by more refined, I mean looked like a freaking alien built it. They ditched the Rover engines for Toyota 1ZZ FE and 2ZZ FE four bangers and threw a supercharged model in to the mix. The naturally aspirated 190 horsepower 2ZZ pulled a mind-bending 1.06 Gs on the skid pad. Did not to 60 in four and a half seconds. There were also a million and a half versions of the Series 2, so I cannot possibly cover them all. <laughs> The company honestly didn't expect the Elise to be that big of a hit, and it ended up saving Lotus's whole ass. GM used the Elise to make the Opel Speedster. Hennessy used it as a basis for the Venom GT, and Tesla built the first gen Roadster on it. In 2009, Lotus debuted their first all new car since the Elise, the slightly more practical Avora with a tiny back seat that you might fit your Springer Spaniel and a mid-mounted 3.5 liter Toyota V6. They're still in production and now they're all supercharged. They make 400 plus sleek yet buff horses. <laughs> Today, Lotus is owned by Geely, and the current talk is of the upcoming fully electric Evija? Evija? Evija. Uh, it's Evia. Evia? The new Avia hypercar. They're only gonna make about 130 of them, but this thing is supposed to have 1,970 Hertzpers going to all four wheels. It looks wild and it's gonna have insane downforce. I don't think I'm gonna be able to afford that one quite yet. I only make a million dollars for each of these episodes.
Lotus might be one of, if not the spunkiest car companies in the history of cars. Did you know their powertrain department designed and developed GM's Ecotec four-cylinder? They did the LT5 V8 for the C4 Corvette ZR1 too. They also designed the cylinder head on the turbocharged 1991 Dodge Spirit RT. They helped Aston Martin with the DB9 chassis, helped Nissan tune the suspension and handling of the new GTR, and that's only a few examples. Lotus has touched way more than you think, or way more than I thought when we started researching this episode. Through it all, they made an indelible mark on both motorsport and the entire automotive market. I always like to succeed at anything I try to do, and I always, uh, always feel that, um, yes, I suppose I am. I always like to try to do anything better that and I see it being done before. Oh, baby. Can you hear her cooing? <laughs> I love you, and I love you. Her coo is so cute.